Good morning. Uh, sorry for any technical difficulties working it out. Um, yeah, so it was on the website, and hopefully it continues to be on the website now. If you missed our first song, we did our first song, and we're going to get into announcements, and prayerfully, uh, this will continue to stream to you uh, in less than ideal circumstances. I'm Pastor Mark. I'm the youth pastor. Uh, pastor Andrew will be giving you the message here in just a few minutes. Uh, pastor David continues to be in Fort Lee, Virginia, and we are just uh, praying for him as he finishes up his schooling. Um, it's a difficult circumstance. Um, and Meredith greets you from home as well. Um, but we just wanted to uh, thank you for joining us on the website. Thank you for joining us in worship. Again, in less than ideal circumstances. We do not want to forsake the gathering of believers, but in times like this, um, it's most loving to stay home and seek to worship together. So we're going to praise God here in a minute through prayer, thanking him for uh, the technology that we have and the opportunity we have to worship with one another. Um, the worship guide for our service is on Facebook. There's a link on the main page of our website, but also it was shared on Facebook, so you can follow along with us uh, as we worship together this morning. Our COVID-19 response, we'll continue to keep you updated on that week by week. We hope to not do this too often. Uh, one, we don't know how well it's going to continue to work. And two, it's not what God designed for the church. Uh, what God designed for the church is for us to gather together as a body of believers and uh, be with one another. And so while this is an alternative uh, that is a good alternative given the circumstances, it is not ideal. And so we hope to be gathering together soon, but we'll keep you updated on that. Please let us know if you have any needs. Uh, we'll continue to try to help you get the supplies that you need through your deacon or Harriet and Joellen. We sent out a call mall earlier this week. If you need help with groceries or anything like that, uh, please contact Harriet Carmel or your deacon. Uh, we'll, we'll help you with what we can. Online giving. Uh, the, the thing that we cannot do, we can, we can sing with one another, or we can hear the word with one another, we can pray with one another, but we cannot give in person. Uh, we, do, we do have opportunity to give online. You can go to our website, www.winfieldbaptistchurch.com. And you can give online. There's an online giving tab at the top uh, top right. The tab is uh, called Give Online. You can click on that. Or you can text to give. You can text 704-997-2325 uh, and set that up. And that is another way that you can give. Or you can give by going to Give Plus Church. Uh, it's an app. You can download the app on your phone, Give Plus Church. Find Winfield Baptist Church, and you can give them that way as well. Pastor David also wanted me to mention that if you are not uh, wanting to give online, uh, then we will welcome you to come to the church off, uh, office during the week, during regular office hours, and drop off your donation um, in, the, in the office, and we will make sure that it gets where it needs to go. Okay? We're going to go through, uh, we're going to go ahead and pray, and... Uh, do our prayer requests here. Um, we're still looking for the best way to distribute our bulletin list. So if you're regular at praying through the back of the bulletin, uh, the list on the back of the bulletin, please continue to do that, and we'll get you an updated list as soon as we figure out the, the best way to distribute that. Please be in prayer for Debbie Loudermilk this week. Uh, she has a brain MRI on Monday, a PET scan on Tuesday, and Wednesday she has an appointment with a doctor to see if the cancer has spread and is at stage four. Uh, so please be in prayer for Debbie Loudermilk. Please also be in prayer for Edna Surface. That's Kenny's aunt. Um, her husband passed away this week. Uh, talked to Kenny. The, the services were, uh, were special to the family, but please be in prayer for uh, Edna Surface as uh, she figures out what life is like without her husband of many years. Uh, we all have unspoken requests, and God knows those. Um, Please continue to be praying for the unsaved in your community and especially the opportunity we get to reach them in this time. Um, and please continue to be in prayer for other gospel preaching churches. Today we're going to preach for churches around the world that are unable to meet in any form or fashion. Uh, and so we are thankful that we get to do this, uh, but there are churches in our county, in our state, and throughout the world that are unable to meet because of the circumstances. And so we want to lift them up in prayer. <clears throat> so please join me in prayer. God, we pray first for our services. Uh, we thank you, as mentioned, for the opportunity we get to meet in the way that we are. Um, 
God, it's not ideal. We know it's not how you designed. Uh, but we thank you for the wisdom um, that you've given us in, in balancing loving our neighbors best, but also continuing to praise your name. Um, and then the opportunity that you've provided through technology to do that um, and feel some semblance of connectivity. God, we know it's, it's no substitute, but we just thank you for that opportunity. Um, and we pray that people would, would seize the opportunity and <clears throat> continue to worship and that they worship with, with pure hearts, that this would not be a hindrance to the worship to you. Uh, God, knowing that they don't need to be in a particular building, uh, they don't need to be with a particular group of people, but God, they can just, we can praise your name wherever we're at. So we pray that that would be the hearts of us here this morning and in our living rooms across uh, the Putnam County. God, we pray that we <clears throat> would uh, reach others. We know that we, through technology, might have an opportunity to reach others that uh, we don't normally. So we pray that your word would go forth um, and that the gospel would be heard. And so we thank you for all those opportunities. God, we pray for other churches around the world that aren't able to meet. Um, we pray uh, that you would just be with them. We pray that you would give the church opportunities to reach out intentionally uh, and stay connected with their people and continue to invest with their people. And God, that they would be creative with ways in which they can worship you. Pray that you would encourage those who are isolated or quarantined, um, that you would encourage them by your word, that they would seek fellowship with you. God, we pray that you would quickly bring back into fellowship those churches with other believers through corporate worship, including our own. God, we pray that you'd strengthen the church and the believers um, in this circumstance, and that it would not be a stumbling block for the church, but God, that your work would be done and you would, we would find ourselves stronger after it. God, we pray specifically for the situation surrounding COVID-19. We again pray for mercy for the afflicted, both in our area, throughout the nation, throughout the world. God, we pray for those who, have, who are affected by it through the sickness itself, that you would heal their bodies. Um, God, that you would protect the elderly and the most vulnerable from getting it. Um, and that we would just see your work done there. God, we also know that this, is, this has many different far-reaching effects. We pray for those who are, are suffering financially, losing their jobs, uh, being temporarily laid off. Um, God, businesses suffering. And we just pray that uh, that you would be with, with those and that you would give them uh, faith in you and an understanding um, that you're in control. God, we pray for our children as they are to be educated, but uh, the inability to get to school, uh, they're not getting educated right now. And so, God, this is far-reaching. We just pray that, that you would have mercy and that um, you would give us wisdom <clears throat> in, in how to deal with those situations. You give wisdom to leadership. Uh, and, and how to best proceed. You give wisdom to medical teams and staff and how to best treat. Um, God, we pray that you give wisdom to the church and how to best meet and how to best meet the needs of others while loving others best. God, we pray for the testimony of the church uh, that we would not look the same as the world in our response, but we would look different <clears throat> and we'd respond well. God, so that, so that your name may be glorified. Pray that you give us great faith in dealing with all these things. That you give us eyes to see how you are working. And God, that your name would be glorified above all. And the gospel would go forth. In your name I pray, amen. Oh, how bright the path, bro. 
robes from day to day, leaning on the everlasting God.
Good morning. That wasn't very good. Try again. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. I'm almost literally preaching to the choir this morning. <clears throat> but uh, this would have been a choir week, so uh, but they obviously were social distancing today. But I want to say thank you to everybody who's who's watching and stewarding the Lord's Day uh, to the best of your ability today. Thank you for being with us. Uh, I want to thank you for uh, spending this time and also supporting us in this way. We've already had some technical difficulties so far, and uh, we're trying to work those things out. I will try to figure out how to stream to the website as well as to Facebook. Uh, but we are thankful for the opportunity uh, to be here with you today and to open God's Word. Uh, so uh, what I'd like you to do is turn or tap, depending on your device, uh, to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. And we will uh, be reading that in just a moment. But what I do want to do is I want to pray for us first. Um, with all of the distractions and everything else going on, uh, I want to pray and kind of get us back in the right mindset. I appreciate Mark's prayer earlier. Uh, while we were scrambling tech-wise uh, to make sure everything was going on, uh, just uh, to refocus ourselves on what, we, uh, what we're doing and uh, not to be overly distracted. So let's pray, and then we'll read 1 Corinthians 15, 12 through 22 uh, together. Father, I thank you for this opportunity to come together this morning. Uh, even though we're not together physically, we're together Lord, online, we're connected. We want to thank you so much for the technology to be able to do this. We want to thank you so much for giving us uh, a worship team that is faithful to come and to, and to lead us in song. We thank you uh, for the ability to come before you in prayer and to lift up others in prayer. Uh, we pray that you would uh, wrap your arms around those who are hurting in our, uh, in our body of believers today. And then also we want to pray that uh, that you would bless the preaching and the hearing of your word this morning. We pray that you would allow us to see the change that you want in our lives based on uh, what you're teaching us uh, from your word today. So, Father, I pray that you'd bless it. Lord, I pray for all of those uh, within the sound of my voice uh, here or uh, anywhere really this morning that you would bless them uh, through your word and uh, meet the needs that they have today, but most importantly, their spiritual need and putting their faith in Jesus Christ. And it's in his name that we pray this morning. Amen. This is the word of the Lord, starting in 1 Corinthians 15, verse 12. But tell me this, since we preach that Christ rose from the dead, why are some of you saying there will be no resurrection of the dead? For if there is no resurrection of the dead, then Christ has not been raised either. And if Christ has not been raised, then all our preaching is useless, and our faith is useless. And we apostles would, would all be lying about God, for we have said that God raised Christ from the grave, but that can't be true if there's no resurrection from the dead. And if there is no resurrection of the dead, then Christ has not been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, then your faith is useless and you're still guilty of your sins. In that case, all who have died believing in Christ are lost. And if our hope in Christ is only for this life, we are more to be pitied than anyone in the world. But in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead. He is the first of a great harvest of all who have died. So you see, just as death came into the world through a man, now the resurrection from the dead has begun through another man. Just as everyone dies, because we all belong to Adam, everyone who belongs to Christ will be given new life. But, I'm sorry, that's where we're stopping today. Uh, so those of you who are standing in your living rooms or some of the worship team, you may be seated uh, this morning. <clears throat> so we're jumping into our, back into our four not of series through the letter to the Corinthians. Uh, if you see me not looking at the camera, two reasons for that this morning. Uh, the worship team is practicing social distancing and a preacher can't just look at one place uh, the whole, the whole message. So uh, that's, that's, I'm not just, it's not an empty room. Uh, although if it would be, I probably would still do that. Uh, but this letter to the Corinthians that Paul writes, is he's writing it because there's a, in a sense, they are not living uh, for the world. They're living of the world. The Corinthian church looked a lot like the world that they were ministering, supposed to be ministering to. The worldliness had crept into the church, and now there were key problems that were causing them to not just propagate sin, but also lead the world, uh, lead the world they were supposed to be ministering to down a path of sin as well. And so in this letter, as we've talked about, it starts out by refocusing them on the gospel of preaching Christ crucified. 
And then chapter 15, preaching Christ is risen from the dead. And those things kind of shape and push us forward to live a life and live in a world that is for the world but not of the world. That we should be people who are uh, spending our time trying to help the world to find the hope that they should have in Jesus Christ, but not focusing all of our time on this world and not focusing all of our time on our selfishness and the things that we want, because that is what the world does. And so how do you be different from the world? That's the main idea of the whole entire, uh, <clears throat> the whole entire letter. And as we get to chapter 15, the, 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 the resurrection, the gospel itself, has lost its centrality. We talked about that last week. But not only did the gospel lose its centrality, it was probably because they misunderstood the resurrection. They didn't know what the resurrection truly meant. And they looked to some of their cultural understandings in order to get their hints. So Paul is addressing in this passage a view in the church that there was no bodily resurrection after death. Now, I don't know uh, about, about you because I can't see you right now, but I'm assuming some of you are thinking, wait, how can you be in the church and not believe in a resurrection uh, from the dead? Well, here's the problem. The problem was the Greco-Roman culture that they had no concept for bodily resurrection after death. They believed in an afterlife, uh, but it was more spiritualized than anything else. And so bodily resurrection, they didn't even have a term for it. In fact, the Greek word for resurrection literally meant just like standing up and rising. In fact, you might say, if you were sick last week, you might say, well, I resurrected this week. I'm feeling better. And it was just kind of a movement up in status, a movement up in life, a movement up even in your feelings. So the understanding of the resurrection was not necessarily uh, in bodily resurrection, but in terms of in this life, making life better. One commentator says Paul's Gentile contemporaries had no notion of a bodily resurrection. Christianity was born into a world where its central claim was known to be false. In other words, nobody believed that you could that anybody else would bodily raise from the dead. Now, the Christians might have believed, yes, Jesus rose from the dead, but they expected that because he was the Son of God. And if Jesus is the Son of God, they kind of expected that that would happen, but it still allowed them to cast an over-spiritualized, kind of symbolic view of the resurrection. Since Jesus rose from the dead, my life can be better and I can raise up myself uh, from whatever status I'm at. So if I am, if I'm poor, I could become more rich. If I have low social status, I can grow. If I want to grow in my occupation, I can do that because of the resurrection of Christ. And it's kind of this, this, um, this warped view maybe that we get from the modern day health and wealth gospel. If I just believe enough, then the resurrection of Christ shows me that if I believe I can achieve and I can do whatever I want and I can grow and God will give me the blessings that I want in this life. And it takes many different forms uh, today. You might see this type of idea where we put an overemphasis on our lives in this world rather than the future life in different ways that we talk where we don't talk about um, <clears throat> we don't talk about things in a biblical way but in a selfish way one way is have you ever heard the concept or the the phrase i'm too blessed to be stressed that god all of a sudden gives me i'm so blessed that i can't you know the things that are happening in my life i have no reason to worry about them because i'm too blessed now someone who says that uh, may be in one of two boats maybe that person really is just ignoring all the problems in life. And they haven't opened their eyes to the fact that, no, actually, uh, your world is collapsing around you and you're partially responsible for that. Or you might be in another boat where life really isn't that difficult for you, but as other people's lives start to get bad, you don't have very much sympathy for them because you're not experiencing the same things that they are. And so you say, well, if you just believed in God, you'd be more, you'd be more blessed and you'd be too blessed to be stressed. Another thing in our culture that we've kind of gotten this idea is that if I do these things for God, if I go to church, if I read my Bible, if I grow in my relationship with him, then certain things will start going better for me. Have you ever thought that? If I get my life right with Christ, then these circumstances in my life that are painful and, and, and that, that are, that are uh, dangerous or life-threatening or just devastatingly depressing, those things will just go away. Have you ever, have you ever thought that? And then we get to a point where we say, well, if that's the way things are, that if I love God, everything in my life will go well for me, we start to hold God accountable when he doesn't give us what we think we need. And we overemphasize this life. And so we start to say things and do things like, God, I've done all of this for you. Why aren't you giving me what I need or what I say that I want? 
Or maybe it's the other way around. You believe that God will bless you in the ways that you think he should if you do the right things. And then when things don't go well, you say, what did I do wrong? And you're just driven by guilt because you believe that the reason why you're not getting the things that you want is because you must be sinning. And so you're driven by guilt. This is what happens when we put too much of an emphasis on the life here in this world and not enough on the future life that is the resurrection of Jesus Christ, eternal life. And so we're using our faith, I put that in quotations, our faith, God, I'm just going to believe and you're going to bless me, or my holiness, I'm going to jump through these hoops. We're using them to get what we want in this life. Well, that's a short-sighted view of Christianity, and I hope if you're listening to my voice this morning, uh, you agree with that, that it is a short-sighted view of Christianity. But here's the main idea, and I hope if you got a chance this morning uh, or, or even yesterday to look at the worship guide, I, I asked you on the worship guide, okay, be able to find the main idea of this message, and then be able to apply it. Here's the main idea of the message. Are you ready? Everybody ready? Don't plan a pity party. Don't plan a pity party. And we're going to talk about that today. The message, the passage is, is, is split up into these three sections. If you're living for this life, the first two points are, are focused on if you're living for this life, here's the pity party that you're planning for yourself. And then the last point is in light of the fact that this life is not all that there is, because Jesus is risen from the dead and you can live for eternal life, here's what you can be certain of today. So the main idea, don't plan a pity party. I wonder if any of you are party planners out there. Uh, I'd ask for a show of hands, but maybe some of you have planned a party, even if you're not a party planner. And I bet that unless it was a gag, nobody planned a party and said, you know what? I want to plan this party so that by an hour and a half into the party, everybody is just in tears with how miserable they are. Nobody wants to be miserable. Nobody wants to plan a pity party. And Paul is like, you need to open your eyes because if you're living for this world, verse 19, more than any other people on the planet, we should be pitied. The resurrection is all something that we affirm. But it's also something we don't always understand. You know, I have never seen someone raised from the dead bodily in a glorified body. I've never seen it. In fact, it was so foreign to the, to the first century Greco-Roman mind that that idea just didn't make a whole lot of sense. I've never seen it. And so because, but what have I seen? I have seen 31 years of life in this world that is cursed and broken and nothing goes according to plan. That's what I can see. And if I live for this world that's cursed and broken and never goes according to plan, I'm going to be in big trouble. See, when we start to focus on this life as if that's all that there is, we value the wrong things. Our, for, our, our focus goes to things like uh, our, our station in life where you are economically, where you are in your job, where your kids are. Uh, we focus on all kinds of things, and, and, and it becomes, it becomes our, our obsession becomes uh, stability or security or, or, or whatever happiness or experience that we want. And some of you are out there going, well, no, 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 I don't want to be, I don't want to be rich, Andrew. But have you ever said this? God, I don't need everything, but here's the baseline. Could you just give me this? Because we're not asking for everything. We think that it makes it better, but we live for those things. And when we live for those things, none of those things are bad. But when we live for them, we've lost our center. And if so, then our faith is useless, it's powerless, and we can expect to be joining the pity party. So the first point, the first way to, the, the first reason why this is a pity party is if we live for, with all of our hopes and dreams in this life, the first point is your faith is meaningless. That's what the passage says. Verses 13 and 14 are almost exactly the same as um, verses 16 and 17. You've got this these series of if-then statements. If there's no bodily resurrection, then not even Jesus rose from the dead. And if not even Jesus rose from the dead, then our preaching is useless, and so is your faith. Now, what does that mean? The word for useless here uh, means it has it's devoid of intellectual, moral, or spiritual value. It's to be empty. If this life is the primary life that we're living for, our faith is meaningless because guess what? No amount of faith is going to make you comfortable, get you exactly what you want economically and out of your relationships, and on and on and on and on. No amount of faith is going to give you what you want. It'll be useless, useless worthless, because this life is not all that there is. 
Last week we saw that Paul went to extraordinary measures to show everybody who saw Jesus after he raised from the dead. But he says here, if there's no bodily resurrection, we're all liars. And this is the biggest hoax. Christianity is the biggest hoax ever constructed. The whole thing is built off of a lie. C.S. Lewis said something similar. His book, Mere Christianity, can be summed up this way. He says that Jesus was one of three things, and there's no middle ground. Jesus was either a liar, a lunatic, or his Lord. And here's why. If somebody says to you, I'm the Son of God, I'm going to die for your sins, and I'm going to raise from the dead never to die again. There's only three options and no middle ground. Either he knows he's not the Son of God and he's lying. It's going to be proven by the fact he's not going to raise from the dead. Or he actually believes he's the son of God, but he's crazy because he's not. And it's going to be proven when he doesn't raise from the dead. But when he predicts that he's going to die and predicts he's going to raise from the dead, and he does it, he pulls it off, he is the Lord, and everything that he says is true. That's the, that's the, 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 the essence of our faith. However, if there's no bodily resurrection... There's no use in you tuning into Facebook Live this morning to listen to the Bible be preached, because guess what? Nothing I preach is going to make your life any better if this is all that there is. It won't. In fact, all of the things that we pour ourselves into and we think, you know, uh, God, what am I going to get out of this deal? Ask yourself that question. What do I think I'm going to get out of this Christianity deal? Do I think that uh, I'm going to get wealth, power, uh, security, stability, by praying, reading the Bible, giving my tithes, going to church whenever we open the doors back up again. Those types of things. When you do those things, what are you hoping to get out of the deal? Are you hoping that God will resurrect you in this life to a better standing, to a better feeling, make your life easier or better? If that's what you're living for, if that's how you're feeling, you've believed in a hoax. Now, here's, here's, the, here's the deal. I'm not preaching about a hoax this morning. I'm preaching about a risen Savior. But that has effects in our lives in the future. It has effects in the way that we put our hope in a future eternal life, not all on the things that can be taken from us in this life. So, if that's the way that we're living, our faith is meaningless, it's useless, it won't help us. But also, it's a pity because your forgiveness is a mirage. He goes through in verses 16 and 17, and he says... If there's no bodily resurrection, then not even Christ is raised. And if Christ is not even raised, then your sins are not forgiven. And everyone who dies believing in Christ is still in their sins. That is absolutely terrifying. Here's what this means. If you're living for today and you believe that your biggest problem is where you are economically, the place that you are in your marriage, the relationships that you have, the grades you're getting in school, the people who don't like you, the things that you're going through, your health issues, if those are your biggest problems today, because that's what you're living for, you've ignored the biggest problem. Now, don't hear me say that I'm ignoring all of those problems. Those things are heavy, they're deep, and Jesus Christ himself is close to the brokenhearted. and he has compassion on us for the things that we go through. But our deepest need is the fact that we are separated from God because of our sins. And if we're living for this life, no amount of Christian living will help us to get out of those things, and no amount of Christian living will help us to be forgiven of our sins. If you're living for the blessings of this world, you're missing the point of the gospel, and you're believing the world's gospel. Let me tell you the world's gospel, and it's super easy for us to to, to fall into and be duped by this gospel today. The world's gospel is this. You need to do everything you can to get whatever you want because you deserve happiness. You deserve security. You deserve to to be able to have the things that you want. If you do good things, you deserve good things. And even if you do bad things, it's not really your fault. It's your environment that forced you to be the way that you are. So you just deserve your happiness. And it's easy for us to believe because we read somewhere in the Bible that God blesses obedience. We read somewhere in the Bible that the way of the transgressor is hard, so we think if we don't sin that God will give us the things that we want. And it's not to say that there aren't blessings for obedience and curses for disobedience. That's not the case. 
But the problem is when we decide, you know what, no God, I'm the one who gets to decide what the blessing looks like in my life. Or no God, the blessing is what I get today and not what I get for eternity. But the problem is still there. You know, your marriage can be healed. You can you can get a raise at work. You can be valedictorian of your class. You can be successful in every stage of life. But if you live for this life and this life alone, you still die in your sins. That's what verse 19 is all about. If our hope in Christ is only for this life, we are more to be pitied than anyone in the world. Don't plan a pity party. We plan a pity party when we live and have all of our hopes and all of our dreams on our circumstances. And I think there's, it's, uh, not, it's not a coincidence today that many of us are living, in a, in a, living our lives in a way that we never planned even two weeks ago. I didn't plan to be doing this today. I didn't plan to be wearing this today. I didn't plan a lot of things today. But we don't put our hope in this world because if we put our hope in this world, this is the best that it's ever going to get. And that's not good news. So, if we live for this world and we live for today only, my faith is meaningless because it's not going to help me gain what I want in this life. And my forgiveness is a mirage because I'm not living for the one who died and was raised for me. I'm living for my life and my blessings today. But that's not the final word. In this passage, this paragraph ends after verse 19. But I wanted to go three more verses today. And we're going to talk about these verses in more depth. Because I wasn't going to stop this Facebook Live without point number three to this sermon because it would have been hopeless. Look at verse 20. But in fact, Christ has been raised. That's the truth. That our, if we are living for a future hope, a future hope, a future resurrection, eternal life with God in heaven forever, your faith is not meaningless. Your forgiveness is not a mirage. And point number two, your future is certain. I don't know what tomorrow holds, but I know who holds tomorrow. I can't promise you anything for the rest of today what's going to happen, but I can promise you what's going to happen for eternity. Those who put their faith in Jesus Christ for their salvation, they will live with him forever in the new heavens and the new earth. And here's how your future affects your faith and your forgiveness, because Christ has been raised from the dead. If, if you believe and you live for eternity rather than for right now, your faith is not meaningless, it's real and it's powerful. Your faith, when you put your trust in Jesus and say, God, no matter what circumstances I go through, I'm going to trust you and I'm going to follow you. Your faith is powerful to do a few things. God wants to work through your faith to make you more like Jesus, to be a bigger witness for the world, to make you different. Did you know that if you live for the world, if you live for eternity, it frees you up in this life to spend time, money, resources, reputation in order to Help other people get to know Jesus. If there's no future, if there's no eternal life, I'm not spending this life doing that. I'm not spending this life giving my last roll of toilet paper to somebody else. I don't know if that was funny because only one person <laughs> here. But for the rest of you, but I can't spend all of my time and I can't spend all of my resources on you if this life is all that there is because I'm running out of time and money. But if Jesus has risen from the dead, and I am going to rise someday too, I have the freedom to live differently by faith because I believe it. And God, by faith, will use me and use us to be the people he's called us to be. Here's the thing. Jesus met physical needs. Jesus went up to people who were hurting, who were lame, blind, they, were, they, they had, they had long-term issues. They, they were people who were paralytics. There were people who were dead. And Jesus walked in, and with his compassion, he healed them. We see dead people rise bodily. We see people who couldn't walk, walk. We see people whose hands were, were crippled with, with arthritis, or they were sick with leprosy. And yet, 
God healed them through Jesus Christ and his ministry. And we see that happen. But here's the truth about all of those people. They're all dead. I urge you, pray for healing if you're sick. Pray for restored relationships. Pray that God will prolong your opportunity to be with your loved ones because this life is important. But this life isn't all that there is. Jesus did those miracles to point us to the ultimate miracle where he said, I have power over sickness. I have power even over death, and I can give you power to live in eternity with me. That's why he did the miracles. So our compassion isn't just for this world, but it's not just for eternity. If we care about eternity, then we'll care about the needs of this world, but we'll use those needs to help and serve others. But your future is certain not just making your faith meaningless, but it makes your forgiveness true. You are forgiven. Remember the world's gospel I said a few minutes ago? The world's gospel says that your biggest problem is you don't get what you deserve, and you need it, and you should go after it, and you should ask God to give it to you. But here's the, here's the gospel that the Bible teaches. The gospel that the Bible teaches says, no, I actually deserve punishment. Why? Because God is holy. God is infinite. Kids, if you're watching this today, the fact that God is infinite and holy means this. It means that there was never a time when God didn't exist. There's no beginning to God. Nobody made him. He wasn't born. He just always was. Now go ask your parents what that means. And it's going to blow their minds. Because we can't understand it. But also, he's holy. He's good. And because he is perfectly good, because because God no sin in him. It is the right thing for God to do to punish people who are sinful. And so the true gospel starts with the bad news before it goes to the good news. And the bad news is not I don't get what I deserve. The bad news is if I get what I deserve, I will get eternal punishment. But Jesus came to earth as a baby. He lived the life that I couldn't live, but I should have lived. He died the death I should have died to pay the price I couldn't pay so that, so that I could be made right with God. But not just for this life. Jesus rose again from the grave, meaning I can have eternal life with him and I don't have to pay the price. See, here's the good news about the gospel. The good news about the gospel is that I'm not going to get what I deserve. So I should never be mad about the fact that God doesn't give me what I deserve. In fact, that's my only hope is that he's not going to give me what I deserve. I'm rejoicing in that today. So what do we do with this? The main point of this message is don't plan a pity party. So my question to you is, are you a pity party planner? Are you a pity party planner? And how would you know if you were? Well, you know if you were, if you were living for today rather than for eternity. And your attitude towards God is such that you expect God to give you certain things because of the way that you act. If that's the case, this is the best that it's ever going to get, and it's not that great. Do you expect God to give you a blessing for jumping through certain religious hoops? Do you expect God to bless you financially or with your health? Remember, even if he does, even if he does, the same fate awaits you that awaited anybody who Jesus healed (laughs) physically. We're all going to die anyway. Do you get bitter at God when things don't go well? Do you just kind of ignore God? Do you find more satisfaction and joy in the creation rather than the creator? Do you find more satisfaction and joy in the gifts that God gave you without thinking about God at all? If so, it may feel like a party here on earth, even though I'm not certain too many people are watching this are like, yeah, this life is a party. But ultimately, we are the most to be pitied in the world. So are you a pity party planner? The second question, that's a more personal application. This one is for our whole church. Is our church the pity party planning committee? Is our church the pity party planning committee? How does the church get there? Well, the church gets there by saying, you know what, here's what we're going to do. We're going to meet all of the physical needs that we possibly can. We're going to preach a message that says, if I am good enough, then God, if you are good enough, if you believe this, if you just do this, God will give you everything that you want. He will bless you. You know, God is not so concerned with how you feel and how you, uh, and, and the blessings that you get in this life that you are concerned about. He is concerned about how you follow him by faith. 
I praise the Lord for the compassion for physical needs that we have in our church. I am so thankful for all of the people who are trying to meet needs in our community. But we live for this life and the life to come. And so the way that we show compassion, when we show compassion to certain people, when we give people what they what they need and what the, what we feel like they uh, they they are feeling the most, when we get to that point, when we live that way, we need to be doing it with eternity in mind. We need to be doing it in such a way that we say, you know what, God, I I want to meet these needs as an opportunity to meet their spiritual need. I want to meet their needs and love them and show them that I can give them what they need and I can give them what they hope to have because I'm not living for this life. If Christ rose from the dead, if Christ is who he says he is, if he did and we have eternal life, we can spend our resources, our time, and our money helping others and pointing them to him because we will live again. Let me close with this. In 2 Corinthians chapter 4, Paul talks about this and how we walk through life. He says in uh, first, or 2 Corinthians 4, 7, we now have this light shining in our hearts, but we ourselves are like fragile clay jars containing a great treasure. This makes it clear that our great power is from God, not from ourselves. We are pleased, we are pressed on every side by troubles, but we're not crushed. We're perplexed, but not driven to despair. We're hunted down, but never abandoned by God. We're knocked down, but we're not destroyed. Through suffering, our bodies continue to share in the death of Christ so that the life of Christ may be seen in our bodies. Yes, we live under constant danger of death because we serve Jesus so that the life of Jesus would be evident in our dying bodies. In verse 16, he says, that's why we never give up. Though our bodies are dying, our spirits are being renewed every day. For our present troubles are small and won't last very long. Yet they produce for us a glory that vastly outweighs them and will last forever. So we don't look at the troubles we can see now. Rather, we fix our eyes on things we cannot that cannot be seen. For the things we see now will soon be gone. But the things we cannot see will last forever. In our trials and in our difficulties, we look forward not to how this life is going to end up for us. We live for how eternity is going to end up for everyone. See, we are not pity party planners, but we're wedding planners. As the church, we are getting ready for a marriage supper of the Lamb. The supper that is the, that is the, the wedding ceremony between Christ and his bride, the church. And we have that hope. And so we push through. And here's what the passage says in 2 Corinthians chapter 4. That as bad as the world and life seems to get, as heavy as it is, and it feels like it's going to crush us, and there's nothing we can do to stand up under it, he says, that pain is going to feel light and temporary in comparison to glory. I have never seen somebody bodily raised from the dead. I have never seen them in their glorified body. But because Jesus Christ rose, and because he is preparing a place for us someday, and because that is my future, I can get ready. I can spend my life helping others get ready for that day. And so I know that I can push through, not because the things that I'm going through aren't difficult, because the things that you're going through, they are difficult, they are painful. However, we can push through because, because someday they will be lifted and we will all be together with the Lord if we put our faith in Jesus Christ. So are you living for today and planning a pity party? Or are you joining the wedding party? Are you joining the wedding planning that we're going to be doing? The choice is yours today for whether or not we're going to serve the Lord or serve ourselves. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the opportunity to worship you today. We thank you for the things that you've allowed us to do uh, technologically. But most of all, we thank you for your word. We pray that it would continue to lead us and guide us, that it would change our lives, and that we would not live for today, but that we would live for eternity. I pray that those under the sound of my voice who heard the gospel today would, would hear it and respond to it in a way that uh, would be real. And I pray that they would uh, reach out to us if they need anything, that we can, we can be able to help them to serve them with the gospel. We thank you for your word. We pray that you would do your work with it. Help us to live for you, not for ourselves. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We 
bow our hearts We bend our knees Oh Spirit, come make us humble We turn our eyes From evil things Oh Lord, we cast down our idols So give us clean hands Give us pure hearts. Let us not lift our souls to another. Give us clean hands. Give us pure hearts. Let us not lift our souls to another. Oh God, let this be a generation that sees. Seek your face. Oh God of Jacob, oh God, let us be a generation that seeks to seek your face. Oh God of Jacob, we bow our hearts. We bend our knees, O oh, Spirit, come make us humble. We turn our eyes from evil things, O oh, Lord, we cast down our idols. So give us clean hands, give us pure hearts, let us not. Give our souls to another. Oh, give us clean hands. Give us pure heart. Let us not lift our souls to another. Oh, God, let this be a generation that sees. Seek your face, oh, God of Jacob. Oh, God, let this be. A generation that sings, seeks your face, oh God of Jacob, oh God of Jacob. We bow our hearts, we bend our knees. Oh, Spirit, come make us humble. All right. Well, thank you for being with us today uh, virtually. Uh, we're going to try and work out some of the kinks and do better next week if this is where we're at. Pay attention to the Facebook page. Uh, pay attention to our website. And then also, uh, if you are, um, if you'd like to be added to our column all, uh, please uh, message the Facebook page or give us, uh, email me at pastorandrew at winfieldbaptistchurch.com. Uh, we're just so thankful that we're able to do this in the midst of everything that's going on. Uh, but be safe, uh, be smart. Uh, the faster we can keep this from spreading or slow the spread, uh, the quicker we'll be back together. So let's everybody do our part to love our neighbors well uh, as we deal with unprecedented times. Um, but we're still going to be preaching the word. We're still going to be praying for you. We'll find other ways to try to connect uh, electronically if we can. And again, if you have any needs, please, please reach out and please let us know. But that's all uh, for this morning. We're going to close in prayer. So Dale, please close us. Heavenly Father, thank you, Lord God, for such a wonderful place to be this morning. Thank you for all the folks that tuned in on Facebook Live that were able to watch the sermon, to be here for, for our church service, Lord, virtually. Lord God, we're so grateful for all you've done for us. And in the light of the recent events, we just pray that you wrap your arms of protection around each and every one of us, Father God. Keep us safe. Help us, Lord God, to be smart as we do the things we have to do in our daily lives. Most importantly, Father God, we hope that you give us the opportunity to share our faith with those around us. Jesus is the only way, Lord God. And, and it's just as time goes on, Father, we just know more and more and more that this old world is coming to an end. Father God, we thank you for Christ. We thank you for, for the cross at Calvary, for the resurrection. Lord God, thank you for Jesus. It's in his holy name we pray. Amen.